Mm. I'm just curious from like the Amazon point of view, like, you know, everyone can self-publish now. You've obviously done it even pre-Amazon, where you've actually printed your own books and now there's print on demand. Has the technology helped or hurt you as an indie author? Um, there's an awful lot of self-published stuff out there that's not up to snuff, kind of, I think. So I think it's kind of messed things up. I got these these two through a micro publisher. Um, I had screenplays, I write screenplays, I had screenplays online um, on a, a website and this author found it and asked if I would adapt her novel series to a screenplay. Mm -hmm. And I did and then she had another author she knew and I did hers which was, a, was an espionage story. And she said she knew a guy that was publishing <coughs> horror and introduced me to him and we got to be good friends and stuff so he published my first two books. So. And do you think that with all the competition on Amazon, do you feel like you get buried sometimes since there's so oh, much yeah, out I mean, there? Oh yeah, you've got to find some way to, to be seen. It doesn't matter how good it is, nobody knows about it. So. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, that leads me to something that Louis said a while ago, the bookstore, local bookstore. Apparently there's a resurgence in local independent bookstores, and the thing that makes the, the ones successful are the ones where the... Um, the, the staff loves books, they actually read books, and rather than carry the New York Times bestseller list, uh, they carry the books that they have discovered that they wow, really great. love, yeah. and those are the books, those are the bookstores that are really making a resurgence and really becoming profitable. Wow, I like that idea. Yeah. Very good. Well, kind of like Diana's done, you know, come out of the indie, and actually, you know, you, you've appeared at Barnes & Noble, couple times for book signings. Do you see yourself moving in that direction or like networking with people like Diane and Larry? Does that kind of give you a connection to get into like those kind of venues? I don't know. I'm, I'm learning a lot. Of what, well, I'm those, those venues, the box stores, are what what are going away. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, the uh, Amazon, am, what Amazon is doing is they, they had a, I guess you call it a brilliant strategy. They've sucked the life out of Barnes and Noble and out of uh, Borders and the whole business, and those stores are collapsing. I mean, you go into a uh, into a, uh, a, um, uh, a Barnes and Noble, and and uh, books take up less than half of the floor space now. Oh wow! Uh, so that whole that whole thing is going away as Amazon is now opening up their box bookstores around the world, and the, that's what's opened up this this vacuum that local bookstores are starting to capitalize on where people who love books, who like to talk about books, who like to who like to connect with people around books, you know, uh, that's the independent that's the new independent bookstore. Wow. And so that's filling all the space that's being left behind by the exodus of the box stores. Okay. It's a strange transition period we've been going through for a yeah. long time now. Mm -hmm. But Barnes and Noble doesn't have to go down. We the people can save it. <laughs> well, but we the, pe we, the, we the people can also say that that, that we prefer go the, buy it. Barnes and Noble. That, that yeah. Neither Barnes and Noble. Well, Barnes and Noble's in trouble because it did things wrong. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it yeah. responded. It responded exactly the opposite of the way it should have responded to Amazon. Independent bookstores responded the wrong way to Amazon. And that's what caused the exodus of independent books first, and then box stores. And the, basically, the, we, the people, need to demand from our businesses what it is we want, rather than just taking what they cram down our throats. Exactly. You know, and exactly. Barnes and Noble is guilty as guilty of that as Amazon is. Yes, and the traditional publishers are probably exactly. the most the, right. guilty yes. of all. Of them. Exactly right. And do we have any more questions that are specific to the story or the reading that was for today? Is that I, I just asked one more, and I've talked to you about this before. I know you don't like to be pegged, but if someone said, what is your genre? And even if you skip around, for this book alone, and if I was going to recommend it, what genre would I tell people this book is in? Uh, it, it, it straddles horror or sci-fi. Probably more horror. Okay. Um, and do you find that limits you? Because I know sometimes you're hesitant yeah. to be pegged as a horror writer. Yeah, I, I like speculative fiction. Okay. You know, uh, I started out with horror. I had a lot of um, childhood stuff Which that I was working spe out. Speculative fiction, as in like Harlan Ellison's Boy and Stuff. Exactly. You guys know that. Exactly. 
I loved Harlan when I was young, at Ray Bradbury and stuff. I'm being compared to Ray Bradbury would be awesome someday. Um, the, the one there was one blurb in here um, comparing this to um, Clyde Barker's Books of Blood, which I was I loved that series um, when it came out. Do so you think that's important? that people get like a handle, like they always say, okay, first what genre, then is it, you know, long fiction, yeah, short always, fiction? It's, all, it's, it's been hard for people to, to pitch and hold my writing, which doesn't help you, I think, as a writer, you know. Well, but that gets back to the bookstores. The only reason that we have genres is because bookstores need to know where to put it yeah. in the, on the shelf, right. you know. But readers are not that sensitive. They're, they're not sensitive to who the publisher is. They're not sensitive to what the genre is. They just want a good story. Right. I, I think, you know, sci-fi, sub-genre sub